So I recently decided that I would be stepping away from any modern true crime, any stories that took place in Wisconsin that a person lost their life or lives and their loved ones are still impacted living to this day. I'm not going to be talking about it. But what I will talk about is what I call vintage true crime. And these are stories that took place in the early 20th century and beyond. So I ended up coming across the story of what I dubbed Wisconsin's Jack the Ripper because of the similarities between this individual and the murderer of the East End of London. So let's talk about Frederick Holman, the sadistic individual that took the lives of as many as 17 people and how he almost got away with it. Let's talk about the forgotten serial killer. So Jack the Ripper is a name I think most people can recognize. He began his reign of terror in the autumn of 1888, as far as we know, and it said that Jack the Ripper is to be responsible for five murders, known as the Canonical Five. He mutilated his victims, and he targeted only ladies of the night, caused widespread panic across London's East End. Even Queen Victoria spoke of the barbaric crimes. Despite garnering national attention, the efforts of the police and public alike Jack the Ripper was never caught, sealing himself as one of history's most notorious serial killers. While a decade after the East End slayings, it seems another Jack the Ripper was on the loose, causing chaos right here in southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. The only difference between these murders and Jack the Ripper's is we have a face to put to our boogeyman, a man who went by the name of Frederick Holman. Frederick, ironically enough, was also attributed to a canonical five, possibly many, many more though, maybe up to as many as 17. And there's a number of eerie similarities between Frederick and Jack the Ripper. So today let's talk about a crime that is rarely spoken about. Frederick Hallman was born in Germany in 1859, and he would immigrate to America shortly after marrying his first wife, Amelia, in 1883. And at the age of 24, they would settle in Grand Haven, Michigan, because that's where Frederick had already had family. He'd worked various jobs, and he and Amelia were very active members of their local Lutheran church. And it was said that Frederick was an intelligent man who could sing beautifully, and he wrote poetry. But that's where the compliments end. It was also noted that he had an odd look to him, even stating that he had a flat head. Frederick was awful to his wife, frequently beating her. And sadly, there isn't a lot of information on Amelia. We know she was German and possibly born in 1846, and that the couple would have their first child, a daughter named Minnie, born in 1885. Sadly, Minnie would die of an undisclosed illness in 1886. Amelia would fall pregnant with their second child not long after, but unfortunately in 1887, she would die during the birth, as did the baby. And this was said to have been very difficult for Frederick took their deaths very hard. So Frederick's really terrible to Amelia and he treats her so bad that it's causing a lot of rumors to spread around town. People just know him as being a very spiteful and vicious man. Um, he, he bad mouths women in general a lot <laughs> and it's very clear that he has a strong disdain for women and it's never really explained why. He never gives a reason why he doesn't like ladies it's just very clear that he doesn't care for them at all and it's not just his wives like I said it's it's many women that he bad mouths or talks very low about and in the book that I was reading about him written by Kevin Collier I believe is how you say his name he does a really great job of going into the past and reading everything about these these people and the side characters in the story of Frederick Holman but what we know is that he gets what is what Kevin referred to as a, a black reputation. He, he's become tarnished amongst the community members. Nobody really wants anything to do with him. He's a woman abuser and this, this kind of pisses people off and we're going to see what eventually happens because it gets a little intense because they're not going to stand for it. 
but he's a very active member of the church community too. He's like one of the first founding members of the local Lutheran church being a German immigrant. Germans are more tied to the Lutheran religion and, you know, so he's very, very important in that community. But at the same time, like I said, he's got this bad reputation now that's preceding him and it's not gonna, it's not gonna turn out well for him. So, like I said before, it was said that he took the deaths of his first wife and the children really hard, but I don't know if it was that hard, because nine months later he would remarry, and he would remarry a 19-year-old woman named Augusta Road, and just like Amelia, he would started using her. They were still living in Grand Haven, but the city was becoming pretty unnerved by the violent and belligerent Holman, and a vigilante group was being formed in an attempt to hang Frederick. So now running from this vigilante squad, the couple moved to Wisconsin where they had their first child, a daughter, and Frederick named the daughter Minnie after his first daughter who passed away. And Wisconsin was also the place where Augusta had family. So this area was kind of like her safety. Tensions would only continue between Augusta and Frederick. And in 1890, Frederick was arrested for beating his wife almost to death. She would even claim that Frederick threatened to hang her. I think that's a bit of ominous foreshadowing about future events. And six months after the birth of their second child, which was a son, and this was in 1892, I believe, Hallman would abandon his second family completely. He would move around in fear of being arrested for deserting them, and this would also be the beginning of the most heinous crimes committed in the 19th century Wisconsin, Illinois area. And at this point, Hallman could have already been starting his murder spree with victims that had never been linked to him officially. So this guy's been chased out of Michigan. He's not really welcome in the Wisconsin area. He's now got to use fake names and aliases to get by and get work without being related to this family, but then at the same time, he will go to these jobs and talk about deserting a family. Like when he's in the Illinois area, I was reading there was a family that he was doing farm work for and he was making offhand remarks about how he deserted a family in Wisconsin and telling other people in other areas that he had a six-year-old son and so on and so forth. It was just kind of weird how he was trying to be undercover, but at the same time selling himself out. Now, again, I'm not sure if you know, the death of his first wife was actually the catalyst to this insane behavior we're about to talk about. But it seems that he would bring up the death of his first wife and children very often. And he would even say that the baby that had passed away was his, you know, his child and that, you know, that, that he loved them very much. But like I said, I thought it was kind of odd that he got remarried so quickly too. I don't know if that was, maybe that's a common thing. I don't really know. I don't really know. But it was just kind of strange. He's acting odd. He's just also known as just a peculiar man, I read. He was just strange, bizarre behavior, the way he acted. And again, he was a very, like, very religious man. But for being so religious, he seemed to, like, not realize how horrible and sinful he was himself. And again, this book does a really, really good job about getting everybody's perspective like he, they went they went so far into detail and getting all the reports of all like the, like the church members the people of the community what they thought about him you know it was just a really really well well done book and I highly recommend you read it if you're interested in this case because it's just so crazy so yeah we're gonna we're gonna jump into the murders now so he's gonna come up on this vicious murdering spree and he's about to target mostly older middle-aged german women but there would be a few it, it, it really it just didn't matter like as long as you were a german housewife that's just seemed to be the criteria and i just again thought it was so weirdly similar to jack the ripper you know he he also targeted women he had such a hatred which is what is assumed with jack the ripper too you know that I, obviously i'm not making the connection that they are one and the same just almost like it's a copycat in a, in a way, like they had similar mindsets, you know, when they, they'd committed, he was also compared to H.H. H. Holmes and H.H. H. Holmes at the time, it's kind of crazy how I think H.H. H. Holmes was executed May 24th, 1896, maybe 1897, right around the same time Frederick's pulling this crazy stunt. And then he ends up dying in like May 
14th, 18th, just kind of weird too, so I don't know. So fast forward to 1896, and this would be the year of his first connected slang. Hallman had been using various names as to keep a low profile, and he was frequently moving around doing various types of work, mostly taking jobs as a farmhand, and he would specifically choose German families to work for. The first murder that he was connected to was in Illinois on June 13, 1896, and the victim was an elderly German woman by the name of Grete Seifkin. The scene was described as a vicious one. It was death by asphyxiation, and Grete was suspended a foot off of the floor from a bedpost, a cord tightly wrapped around her neck, and this would be Frederick's modus operandi. He would be doing this to every victim except for one. Grete's death was staged by Hallman as if it was to look like a suicide, and it worked because Grete's husband, Matthias, and her son from a previous marriage, Anton, were so perturbed that they left poor Grete hang like that until the next day when they finally told the authorities. This obviously caused suspicion to fall on the two and giving Frederick the perfect diversion to continue out the terrible crimes he would continue to commit. On the day of Grete's murder, Hallman had picked up work at the neighbor's house, but for now that would go unnoticed, and Hallman would head right back to Wisconsin, and it was said he was working at a farm in Kenosha as a corn shucker, a short distance away from where the second murder would take place. So this guy is pretty messed up, and he's only going to prove that he's crazier than anybody thought. If hanging people by their necks with words and tying them up to like bedposts and doorknobs to try to make it look like a suicide isn't disturbing enough. The next crime he commits is probably his worst one. And it's, it's again similar to Jack the Ripper. It's like he starts getting more and more confident and brazen and comfortable. The only difference is that we've, we did catch our boogeyman. It's just really bizarre how similar they are. So anyways, He's going to go unnoticed for a little bit, but eventually they're going to start noticing a pattern. And all these places where these women are starting to turn up dead, there's one man that's always in the area. And he's going by the alias of like Fred Hartman and Fred Lang, but he always uses Fred. He's not, he's clearly not that smart if he can't even change his first name. Maybe because it's harder to like pursue an identity. I don't know. I don't know how it works that. But he's continuing to get work at these German farms and target these people. And he's also being reported across like Illinois and Wisconsin. There's reports coming in of a man named Fred or somebody with the same description as this Fred who's assaulting women or making threats or, or telling them they're going to... Like he's so specific to like, I'm going to hang you. And then he goes and commits these atrocious, atrocious crimes. It's like he's giving himself away. It's almost like he wants to be caught. I don't know, but yeah, I guess let's, let's keep going, right? Because it's only going to get worse, so buckle up. So on the 4th of July of 1896, August Helgendorf would find his wife Bertha, age 56, also German, deceased in their milk house. And again, a gruesome crime scene would be described. Bertha was butchered. And the weapon was said to be a rusty corn scythe. Her skull caved in. It was a barbaric sight. And again, the blame would end up falling on the significant other of the victim, Bertha's husband August and their son Bernard. And by September, August was sentenced to upon prison for the murder of Bertha Hilgendorf. Now police were very slowly starting to connect the dots and the hunt was on for this infamous Fred as he was going by either Fred Lang or Fred Hartman or whichever, it was always a Fred. But sadly, Hallman was just starting his crime spree and he was still in the area of Kenosha County, Wisconsin. He would target his next victim in Summers and once again, his modus operandi would be used. On September 20th, 1896, after a couple of weeks of staking out the residence of Anna Catherine Moore, 
Holman made his move shortly after Anna's son departed from their home. Frederick slipped into the house and he attacked the 73-year-old woman. And after his brutal assault on Moore, she was hung up by her neck with a cord and suspended from a doorknob. She was also robbed of $25. Her son would find her and notify authorities immediately and her death would be ruled a suicide. So at first these murders are going, the blame is going on on either like the husbands and the sons or, you know, it's just dubbed suicides. And it's just, it's slowly catching on after the coroners are taking a look at the bodies and they're reviewing evidence and stuff. And they're coming back like, this doesn't make sense. And like I said, they're getting more reports of women being assaulted by this mysterious Fred. And he's going around, he's posing as like, chicken salesman at one point or you know he's he's also he's robbing every single victim as well and taking their jewelry or their money or whatever so he's also in the possession of like female watches and female jewelry and stuff so this is gonna look strange later on and, and eventually it's all connected back to one man and one man alone and i almost just i almost i do feel terribly sorry for the wife that he had at that point that he abandoned could you imagine finding out like later that you got abandoned by your serial killer husband that could have been you that's terrifying and then to think like he his children and all those it, it just gets worse though i mean you you, you can't prepare for what's how awful he, there there's nothing that he that he's not capable of He's just such an unhinged individual. And this also makes him the perfect specimen. I, I'll tell you what, it's pretty crazy what happens to him post-mortem, but we'll get into that later. So yeah, let's continue. So Frederick was now a wanted man, even though it was Frederick with a different last name every time, they were starting to realize that this was the exact same person in various reports of assaults, attempted murders, and many other crimes. So from all over southeastern Wisconsin and northeastern Illinois, this guy is public enemy number one. Again, all the victims were German women who said Frederick tried to strangle them after making unwanted advances. And that's coming from these victims that survived Frederick, the ones that weren't murdered, but they described the exact same individual. And they were German. It's just all the same modus operandi, almost getting strangled. And, you know, he makes derogatory remarks to all of them. He's just, he's horrible. And he's on the loose. And it just gets worse. So now uh, Hallman's back in Illinois. He's in Iroquois County. And his next murder would be on Thanksgiving Day of 1896. A young 22-year-old mother and wife, Carolyn Lenz, who went by the name of Carrie, she was with her two young children at home cooking while her husband was out. Along came Frederick knocking on the door and it was believed that maybe she didn't think it was suspicious because Frederick had worked for her husband at one point and little did she know she had just let in a serial killer. So he was said to have strangled Poor Carrie, and he suspended her again a few inches off the floor by a cord around the neck, tied to a doorknob. Her children were home, but they were thankfully unharmed. And this would not be ruled a suicide, surprisingly. Her husband just knew that this was not, she didn't kill herself, and there were even defensive marks. Carrie put up a fight, she fought for her life. But she didn't succeed, sadly. And Hallman was swiftly connected to the murder. And unfortunately, he was already on the move. So now in Ford County, Illinois, it was December 2nd, 1896. And his last victim, that was at least officially tied to Frederick, would be the only murder he would be charged with. And that would be the murder of Vidka Geddes. So finally, one of the murders isn't considered a suicide or, you know, that her death isn't falling on her husband. Unfortunately, though, he's on the move. He's now moving into Ford County, Illinois. And over there, they're not very well informed just yet. And I think in between this murder and 
the last one. Yeah, I think so. I think he gets arrested between one of those two points. He's arrested, and at that time, the police don't know that he's a wanted man. They have no idea that they had just arrested a serial killer. And they arrested him because they found him under a woman's bed. And it happened to be the police uh, or the local marshal's wife. I don't know. I can't remember. Something like that. But it was just so insane. They were this close. They could have saved a life had they caught him, you know, before they realized who he was. But, you know, this was the 1890s. They did the best they could, I think. So he's still on the loose and he's committing more crimes in between. But more people are coming out saying, like, they saw this guy trying to sell women's jewelry and trying to sell a woman's watch. There was a couple that said that they were drinking and playing cards with him just before he's about to go attack poor Vidka. And he's also seen with the exact same twine cord that was wrapped around one of the victim's necks. All the evidence is starting to add up. It's all starting to collectively pile up on him. And it's 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 about to be his time. It's about to close in. But, you know, he's he's got one more atrocity to commit before. So I guess let's let's continue. As her husband, Fred Geddes, left their home early in the morning, it was said that 28-year-old Vidka and their six-year-old daughter were still in bed when Holman had entered the residence. And it was said that Holman had been posing as a poultry salesman and had been harassing poor Vidka a couple days before her murder. So he must have been keeping an eye on her house and waited for his opportunity to strike. Sneaking into Vidka's room where she laid in bed, Frederick attacked her, strangling Vidka and her child. Though he only struck Vidka from a cord tied to a doorknob, the Geddes's six-year-old survived. Oddly, she would implicate her father as the killer, and suspicion would fall on Fred. It was said that they had found bloody clothes that belonged to Mr. Geddes in the barn, but later it was discovered that Hallman had wore Fred Geddes's clothes to murder Vidka. So this is the last victim in the canonical five. Like I said, there was actually a, an additional killing that occurred that they did tie directly to Frederick. But during this period, that was unbeknownst to everybody. And again, he could have been responsible to up to as many as 17 people. Um, but anyways, so Fred Geddes was implicated by his six-year-old daughter and the reason for that is she was six years old she was probably terrified um it was also said that she tried to cut her mom down and that her mom wouldn't wake up and she was just she was in a state of, of chaos when they found her she was very scared so it isn't so hard to believe that she would just start saying things she was six years old again so Eventually, though, they would realize that they couldn't really take the child's word for anything, that her, her credibility wasn't there because she's, she's a kid. She's a traumatized kid at that. So eventually, though, um, they, they do arrest Fred. A lot of blame falls on him, obviously, because, um, you know, Hallman was smart. He wore Fred's clothes. He was able to get a hold of them. Like, he must have been staking out the residence and, you know, watching for when they were doing laundry because he he would do things like that he he was he was smart they said so he clearly but not that smart obviously obviously he was an idiot too but i digress he must have been watching for when he was given the opportunity to take some of fred geddes's clothes use those discarded them in the barn to make it look like fred did it fred geddes did it and you know it was easy as one, two, three. And this gave him another little head, like probably what he thought was another head start to get on to the next victim. But unfortunately, this is about to be the turning point where everything is going to start caving in. You can only run so far and so long before the law or, you know, karma in general will just catch up to you. And that's exactly what's going to happen to Fred Holman. So I guess let's continue. By December 5, 1896, both Illinois and Wisconsin police were searching for Frederick Holman. The law would catch up with him that very day while he was working as a farmhand still in Ford County, Illinois. He was taken to jail, but the citizens were still not happy and demanded justice. Rumors of a vigilante group were circling, 
saying they'd hang home and themselves for Geddes' murder. Eventually, tempers would calm, and an execution date of May 14, 1897 was agreed on. Frederick would even help construct the gallows where he would meet his end, but he seemed unbothered by his fate. He was said to be very cheery and prideful in his handiwork, and he even requested a special coffin be made with a window for his face. But ironically enough, the University of Illinois took Holman's head for close examination, and in one final act of defiance, it was said that Holman had threatened his executioner, stating that he would come back and haunt them. He was hung at Ford County Jail and buried at Glen Cemetery in a pauper's grave. He was denied his request to be buried by his first wife in Grand Haven, Michigan. So that was Wisconsin's Jack the Ripper, the story of Frederick Holman. I briefly wanted to talk about what happened to the second family that he had abandoned, Augusta and their two children. So it was said that Frederick had tried to reach out to Augusta at one point and get her to like leave the area where she was staying, but she refused and for good reason. So she would tell her children, the two children they had, that their dad had passed away in a railway accident in the early 1900s. So they grew up having no idea that their father was an infamous serial killer. I'm sure Augusta knew, and I'm sure that was really difficult, but it was just probably like a really dark secret that she had held on to. So even the descendants had no idea until the 2010s when Kevin Collier, who wrote um, the book on Frederick, which is called Final Doom. So he was the one that broke the news that they were related to one of the most infamous and most forgotten serial killers of all time. And I think that was maybe maybe one last little, hey, F you, Frederick. You thought you were going to be remembered like, you know, H.H. H. Holmes? No, you didn't get that courtesy. You don't get any courtesy. They didn't deserve that either, but just saying, I think it's great that nobody remembered him. Um, yeah, just a bizarre guy. Real sick, real sick dude. Real sick dude. I was really happy to hear that the children, for the most part, remained unharmed and the one that he attempted to kill survived. But yeah, again, that was the story of Wisconsin's Jack the Ripper. And, you know, if you want to read more about it, I would highly recommend that book. Definitely read that book. I, I got sucked into it. And I mean, there's just so much. But thank you so much for watching. And, you know, catch you in the next one.